Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Alhambra First United Methodist Church. Happy to be here today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, happy to have David here guesting with us as accompanist while Michael's out. Um, and let's get started. Stand if you're able for our first song. It's number 352 in the hymnal, or you can read it on the screen. It's me, it's me, oh Lord. scripture this week comes from Acts chapter 2 verses 17 and 21. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Everyone who calls on the Lord will be saved. Thanks be to God for the gift of these holy words. Thank you. 
here, Michael, of our world this day. We pray for those who are suffering, especially from acts of violence. We pray that we will find peace in our society and with one another. We pray for the war in Ukraine. We pray specifically for Bishop Christian Alstead, who is our United Methodist Bishop for that area, is now visiting Ukraine. Pray that you would watch over him, be with the churches and the leaders that are there. We thank you that on this day of Pentecost, that you call us to be filled with your Spirit. Let us join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us join together in reading this passage from Acts 2, verses 1 to 13. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at the sound of this the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Ammonites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs in our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and say, They are filled with new wine. I want to congratulate you all. Did great on all those words, all those uh, <laughs> list of the uh, various uh, people from that area of the world. So believe it or not, when I was in my first year of college at PCC, I was visiting the Holy Deliverance Church, a black Pentecostal church up here in Pasadena, where my good friend Keith uh, was preaching, guest preaching that day. And during the altar call, I went forward, and the preacher of the church tapped me on the head, and I was slain in the spirit. I fell flat on my back, and it felt as if a hand was lowering me down. And then they placed a Bible on my chest, and they prayed for me. And out of that experience came my call to ministry. I had been wrestling with that uh, for about six months as to whether that was what God was calling me to do. And out of that experience, among many others, helped confirm that that is what God was calling me to do. It was during the height of the Jesus movement, and we had many things going on in our culture and society uh, where people were longing for a deeper spiritual life. A couple of years earlier, a uh, lay witness group came to my church. Some of you may remember those particular groups. It came out of 
Nashville out of the old board of evangelism, ironically enough, where I worked uh, eventually. But that group came to the church, and our pastor was, you know, taking the Sunday off. Uh, he did not know what was happening at his church when he was gone. But, but the group came and met with the youth. They said things like, God loves you, and I love you. And for many of us, it was the first time that we really heard the idea that Jesus loved us. And so we were gathered in a chapel just, just like this, and uh, they asked us to come forward and give our lives to Christ as and that God's will be done, as God would will in our lives. And the Spirit came among us. In fact, we were so filled with the Spirit that we got up from the altar and we charged into the main sanctuary right in the middle of the worship service and went to the altar and prayed. Now you can imagine what our parents thought about that. <laughs> and when the pastor came back, he wasn't too sure what happened either. They said, it looks like they're becoming holy rollers. <laughs> what are we going to do about this? This was the problem that John Wesley was having early in the Methodist movement. After being banned from preaching in the Methodist, in the Episcopalian churches, even though he was a priest in that church, uh, he had been preaching that people were not born into the faith. Just because you were an uh, Englishman, you were not a Christian. That's what he would say. Of course, people did not like hearing that. He said, you need to accept Jesus for yourself. And so as a result, he was not allowed to preach in many of the churches. On February 17th, 1739, he wrote in his journal that he was invited by his friend George Whitfield to preach in the open air, out in the middle of a field to coal miners. And this is what he said. In the evening, I reached Bristol and met Mr. Whitfield there. I could scarce reconcile myself at first to the strange way of preaching. Preaching in the fields, of which he set me an example on Sunday, having been all my life, till very lately, so tenacious of every point relating to decency and order that I should have thought of the saving of souls almost a sin, as if I had not been doing that so in a church. At four in the morning, I submitted, excuse me, at four in the afternoon, I submitted to be more vile and proclaimed in the highways the glad tidings of salvation. Speaking from a little eminence in a ground adjoining to the city to about 3,000 people, the scripture on which I spoke was this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he had anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Now, those who observed his preachings said that it was very dry. Where George Whitfield was considered one of the greatest preachers of his time, Wesley just simply took out his journal and just read sort of methodically the words that he had written to the crowd. But something strange began to happen. Even though his delivery wasn't so great, his words were having a profound effect on the crowd. It wasn't uncommon for people just to fall down and start convulsing on the ground with the Spirit of God upon them. Then people would go and pray for those individuals. This did not sit well. They called him an enthusiast. Uh, this did not sit well with many of Wesley's fellow contemporaries in the Church of England. He was often chased out of cities. In his journal, he writes of the events on September 12, 1742, when he was preaching to a, in a field to a crowd. Many of the cows of the people, there were cows nearby, labored much to disturb those who were of a better mind. They endeavored to drive in a herd of cows among them, but the brutes were wiser than their master. So you can expect he was out there preaching, and the people opposed him were trying to get a herd of cows to go through the crowd. That didn't work. Not totally disheartened, 
By the failures of their unpredictable, obviously unmotivated cattle, the demonstrators did something else. They began throwing stones. One struck me just between the eyes, but I felt no pain at all. When I had wiped away the blood, went on testifying with a loud voice that God had given them that believed not the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. In his later years, Wesley wrote, The Holy Spirit began to move among us with amazing power when we met in his name. These unusual works of the Holy Spirit continued to follow and bless my ministry. Now, while Methodists may lay claim to John Wesley, it may be surprising you to know that the Pentecostal movement, with denominations like the Assemblies of God and the Holiness Churches, all trace their lineage back to John Wesley. They also quote John Wesley in their sermons <laughs> and look to him as sort of the beginning of their movement. One Pentecostal writer says this, John Wesley's chief distinctive was Christian perfection or the ongoing of the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers whereby they are enabled to love God with all their hearts, souls, and minds and their neighbors as themselves. For Pentecostals, being born again or born of the Spirit is an outward sign of God's, of Wesley's doctrine of sanctification. The writer also says, John Wesley's emphasis on sanctification as a deeper experience beyond justification and on the agency of the Holy Spirit in the Christian life not only resulted in the founding of Methodism, and contributing to the holiness movement, they eventually became the main factor in the rise of Pentecostalism. What was it that Wesley captured that had such a profound effect on the Christian faith of his time and our time? It was this focus on the importance of the Holy Spirit. As we look at Acts 2, 1 through 13, we have these four words that help capture what happened that day. First is all. It says on the day of Pentecost, now the day of Pentecost was a Jewish holiday, also known as the Festival of Weeks. It was uh, 70 days or no, 50 days after uh, Passover and for us Easter. And this harvest festival was celebrated God's covenant relationships with the Jewish people. It says when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Before, the disciples had been scattered, but they came together. And in Acts 1, it talks about how Jesus appeared to them uh, one last time. But here they were, not only the disciples, but people from all over the Roman Empire had gathered Jewish people to celebrate the day of Pentecost. But then came the wind and the fire. The wind represents God's surprising encounters with people, and fire represents the Spirit's refining power in our hearts. Acts 2, 2 through 4 says, And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Now, have you ever been in a place where you've heard a violent wind? Now, in Nashville, there are hurricanes or tornadoes that come through uh, quite often. And you will talk to people who have been in the midst of a tornado. One time, uh, Jez and I were driving the car, and suddenly the wind started going like this, and we hurriedly got to our house and got into our safe place, but it didn't come to directly to our house. But the sound of the wind is like a train going right over our house, just this huge sound that just rolls right over you. Well, that's what was being described here. A sound like a mighty wind came into that place and settled upon them. And it probably attracted many people in the city to come see what in the world 
what was happening. And it said, Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other languages, and the Spirit gave them ability. So the third word is speak. So have you ever been in a place, maybe traveling, and um, you did not know the language? I was in uh, Norway one time, and uh, I went to this little food stall to get something, and the man started speaking to me in Norwegian, because he thought I, obviously, I looked like a Norwegian according to him, and so obviously he thought I would understand what he was saying, which I didn't. Uh, when he figured out that I only spoke English, he was severely disappointed in me at that moment. <laughs> Finally, another person came along and spoke to me in English and translated for us so I could uh, obtain the food I was looking for. But that experience of hearing your own language that you were born with, that you grew up with, when you are in a different place, is a profound experience. It's an experience of grace. And here it says in Acts 2, 5, amazed and astonished, they ask, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Now, that was a sort of a slight against the Galileans, if you didn't figure that out. The Galileans were not part of Jerusalem. They were up north. And they were sort of looked down upon by the other people as being uneducated uh, people who did know very much. And we remember when uh, Peter was outside where Jesus was arrested and the woman asked him, you know, who are you? And he spoke, and they said, oh, you were one of his people. Why? Because he had a Galilean accent. And that's how they could identify that he was one of Jesus' disciples. But here, these uneducated people who probably didn't travel much in their life were speaking in the native language of all these various peoples from around the Roman Empire. And they were amazed. And it confirmed to them that God was at work. God was doing a new thing among them. And then the fourth word is wine. New wine represents God's new covenant through Jesus. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. Of course, they are saying this as an insult. <laughs> but actually, it was a very profound word where it captured exactly what was going on. Remember Jesus at the wedding feast where he turned water into wine? And remember when he said in Matthew 9, neither is new wine put into old wineskins, Otherwise, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. When we receive the new wine of Christ, we are made new in the name of Jesus. In Luke 22, during the Last Supper, he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This is the new wine that is poured out for you. This is the new covenant in my blood. Today, new wine represents the filling of the Holy Spirit. So my question for you today, are you ready to be made new? Wesley taught that communion was a means of grace, that through taking communion we are transformed by the Spirit of God through 
Jesus Christ. It is a sacrament that moves us from one place to another, that we become new in Christ. This new covenant that Jesus talked about was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon that whole crowd. And guess what happened? What do you think those people did when they went home? Do you imagine that they began speaking about what had happened in Jerusalem? Were you there? Did you see that? What was God doing among those people? And soon the word of God's work in Jesus began to spread throughout the whole Roman Empire. God's spirit was at work among them. That same spirit is with us today. You are called to be renewed and filled for Jesus' blessing is for all who hear the word this day. Let us pray. Most gracious God, Sometimes it's hard in the midst of our struggles and daily life and the details that we are trying to pay attention to, to keep things going, to hear your voice. Help us to take a moment to hear your voice this day, to fill your call in our hearts, that call to follow and serve you, that call to be filled with your spirit. Fill us this day. Amen. See?